It's four o'clock on a Thursday. You know what that means, don't you, kids? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Today, starring. What are we starring today? More precise definitions in the listings. Yeah, woohoo! And thank you, fake audience. Thank you, awesome fake band. Let us see who's in the chat room before we start talking about clarifying some things in Taxi's A&R listings. Let's see, we've got, let me go to the top of the list here. We've got Ian Shortall, Martin Gravel, Bob Gunnerfelt, uh, Dean Turner, Paul Etheridge, Andre, Andre Stepanian, Ewart Williams, Marion Laird, Peter Rahill, Robert Orzachowski, Deborah Davis. Hello, Deborah. That's a new name to me. Uh, Welcome for the first time or welcome back. Alex Dillon, Riney Bear, Peter Rahill, Darren Fletcher, Aaron Northern, Jesse J. Peck, uh, Lane Bell and Shrek, uh, Bonzo 230, Darren Moss, all the way from... Australia, Jen Weilidge, Dan Weber. Well, it's good to see you guys here today. Nancy Collell, um, thank you for letting me have yesterday off from the big show so that I could get some road rally work done. I'm still behind where I want to be. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, and I'm going to re-mention, I'm also taking off tomorrow. But we will be back on Monday with a regular episode of Taxi TV. Um, and who am I having? Uh, I'm having taxi member Ed Hartman, who is a percussionist by trade, but who's killing it, um, getting placements and, uh, also is, is an expert on scoring short films, which I thought might be an interesting topic to delve into. So that's going to be happening on Monday. And while we're at it, give us a like, would you hit that thumbs up, that blue thumb, uh, also, if you've not uh, um, subscribed to this channel yet, please do so that you can get notifications when we go live. Also, hit that little notification bell up at the top of your page. I believe it's the top of your page. Uh, let's see, who else? Glenn Letts, um, Pierre Venio. All right, so most of the gang is here. wonder where John Pearson is. We know where Cass is. Cass is working right now uh, at the open, right, I think. Um, Ronald Schultz, hello. So I want to start today's show with uh, something ridiculous that I saw about 10 minutes ago. You guys know how I love the media, love the press, um, how they're never prone to exaggeration. Hello, Edmund Red. And just some of the stuff I see in in media is just, to me, um, crazy. Uh, The way they report stuff, I think that they're literally trying to scare us. Hello, Giovanni Lanza. Um, So about, I don't know, five or 10 minutes ago, uh, I saw an article from AP, the Associated Press, which is supposed to be kind of a a stalwart of reportage, right? Hello, Dave Morgan. Oh, I've got a nostril hair tickling my nose. Shall I go get the tweezers and tweeze a nostril hair while we're on air? (laughs) That would be something I haven't done yet. Um, Did I say hello to Dave Dorgan yet? And Robert Martin, hello, and Marion Laird. Um, (laughs) Marion Laird won't be chatting much while she listens the first half. She's going to be warming up some leftovers. (laughs) All right, so here is today's humor. Um, I, I just can't believe this. Hello, Mark Real and Carrie Hardigan. So I saw an article from the Associated Press with the headline, get this, infection rates soar in college towns as students return. And now I'm going to read you some excerpts um, from this article. Dateline, Muncie, Indiana, Associated Press. Just two weeks after students started returning to Ball State University last month, the surrounding county had become Indiana's coronavirus epicenter. 
Out of nearly 600 students tested for the virus, and we know how accurate those tests have been so far, more than half have been positive. Dozens of infections have been blamed on off-campus parties, prompting university officials to admonish students. Admonish them, damn it. University President Jeffrey Mearns wrote that cases apparently were tied not to classrooms or dormitories, but to the poor personal choices some students are making, primarily off campus. I mean, what the hell? College students making poor choices? Oh my goodness. <laughs> the actions, he goes on to say, the actions of these students are putting our planned on-campus instruction and activities at risk. And further down the article, it said, at James Madison University in Virginia, which recently sent students home through September amid a surge in cases, the county is averaging a weekly infection rate of nearly 90 cases per 100,000 people, more than eight times that statewide average. Um, health officials fear that surges among college students will spread to more vulnerable people, older ones and those with underlying health problems, and trigger a new wave of cases and hospitalizations. Some worry that colleges could overwhelm hospitals already bracing for increasing cases of COVID-19 uh, and flu this fall and winter. Well, just to remind the Associated Press, even when COVID was raging and at its peak, nowhere in the entire United States hospital system did we run out of hospital beds or ventilators. As a matter of fact, if you remember, we sent that big old ship, I forget the name of it, the Mercy, I think, that big old hospital ship to New York City, barely any beds got used. Did we take the Javits Convention Center and turn that into a giant hospital with thousands of beds? Yes. How many of those beds got used? Practically none. So there was no overwhelming. We were prepared, we were overprepared, and uh, didn't overwhelm anything. But here's the funniest part. Now, I am not a math genius, um, but 90 cases per 100,000 people. Um, let's do the math together. So 10% of 100,000 people would be 10,000 cases. 1% of 100,000 people would be 1,000 cases, right? One-tenth of 1% 1 would be 100 cases. That'd be one-tenth of 1% 1 would be of, yeah, 100 cases out of 100,000 people would be one-tenth of 1%. One and they had an infection rate of nearly 90 cases. So less than one-tenth of 1% 1 generates a headline, infection rates soar in college towns as students return. And note that it wasn't in the classrooms or dormitories. It was by poor, 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 poor personal choices some students are making primarily off campus. Um, what else did I see in here that I personally found to be funny? Um, oh, at James Madison University in Virginia, which recently sent students home through September. So does that sound familiar? So if you've got uh, like a closed off community college campus, right? And it's not the classrooms and it's not the dormitories, um, that's, 0.0009%. Well, there you go. That sounds like a soaring infection rate, doesn't it? Um, so what are they doing? They're sending students home. Doesn't that sound like New York State where they took all the elderly people who had uh, COVID and sent them back to the, the old age homes? where you know, thousands of people ended up dying because they sent the infection back into, I mean, crazy. So in this case, they're sending them home. Who are they sending them home to? Mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. And if you figure that you've got you know, 10,000, 20,000 kids on a college campus and we're sending them home, that means now hundreds of cities that they're from are gonna get cases because of this so soaring infection rate. They're dispersing it nationwide rather than you know keeping everybody 
locked down on a college campus. Is it just me? Is it just me? Or should the media, yes, Michael's editorial rant, should the media, that's my problem. I've got a problem with the media. Coming up with a, a headline, infection rates soar in college towns as students return. Wouldn't a better headline have been, we've seen a little increase in infection rates, mostly due to dopey college kids drinking at massive parties off campus. Really? I mean, just saying. I'm waiting for Rod Serling to pop out from behind Scott Pelley's desk and say, just kidding, folks, the media's not crazy. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it, it's, am I nuts? Does the media, why are they trying to scare us? I, I don't get it. But would you click on the link if the title was just the fact? Um, probably not. But then again, so are they allowed to be unbelievably exaggerative? Not to mention the bad decision of sending, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 college kids who, you know, according to Ball State University, 50% of their students are infected based on a sample of 600 tested. Why would you um, want to send uh, Ball State University here? Let's find out how many students Ball State University has. How many students at Ball State University? In 2016, there were 21,998 students enrolled in Ball State University. Okay, so 22,000. I'm rounding up by two. Um, <laughs> So if they had 22,000 students and by their test or sample of 600 students, half of them, more than half of them tested positive, why would you take 11,000 by that math, 11,000 students and disperse them to the cities from and towns from whence they came? I don't get it. That's right, where is Walter Cronkite when you need him? That's when you could trust the news, right? Anyone watch Social Dilemma on Netflix? I haven't, but apparently it's good or you wouldn't be asking, right? Um, all right, anyway, so there's my little rant. Again, not political, not taking a left side or a right side. I am only reaming the media because most people just read the headlines. Infection rates soar in college towns as students return. <gasps> oh my God. And that's what people know. That's what people see. That's what they remember. And that's what society is basing its feelings and decisions on. Anyway. On to the subjects of the day, and I want to thank you guys for posting some good stuff in the comments the other day. I really, really appreciate that because it gives me something to talk to you guys about rather than just sitting here talking about gophers and tomatoes. Um, all right, and Pierre Venio asked a really good question. Um, some more precise definition and listing descriptions. Uh, what do you mean by give or take two minutes. Uh, so let me take, he's got a few of them listed off and I'm gonna take them one by one. So actually what it typically says is about two minutes long. We're talking about the length of cues that the companies are asking us for. Um, so we'll say about and notice that we even italicize the word about, so, you know, about two minutes, give or take. So Here's why we do that. About three years ago, we would just say they want stuff, uh, they're looking for cues that are between 90 seconds and two minutes long. And we actually had a, re a screener return an excellent cue because it was like, you know, 87 seconds long. It was a really good cue, certainly should have been a forward and the screener returned it because it was a few seconds short of 90 seconds. Now the screener 
thought he or she was just being responsible. It says 90 seconds, so I'm sorry, this is short of 90 seconds. I'm not going to forward it. Um, I mean, there may be times when a precise time is needed, and we would tell you that. But that was the day where we made the decision to start saying about 90 seconds to two minutes or whatever it is, uh, about 90 seconds to two minutes long, comma, give or take. Meaning about 90 seconds could be 87 seconds. It wouldn't be 45 seconds. So, you know, there is a little bit of judgment involved uh, because about, what does about mean? Well, it means about, you know, <laughs> about 90 seconds. So clearly 71 seconds is not that close to about. 45 seconds is not that close to about, but 87 seconds is very close to 90 seconds. So that's about 90 seconds, right? And then, you know, between 90 seconds and two minutes long, comma, give or take, meaning there's a little fudge factor on either side, you know? So if it's like 87 seconds or if it runs two minutes and 41 seconds, that doesn't mess anybody up. We're just trying to give you guys something to go on. Otherwise, people would be sending in cues that were 41 seconds long or four and a half minutes long. Those are unusable lengths. So there's our explanation of that one. And frankly, Pierre, much as I love you, I don't see how that's not clear when we say about 90 seconds to two minutes long, give or take, right? Um, Il Rosso Emil, sorry to be like, don't worry about it. It's not like, <laughs> not like we've got hard, fast rules. Um, <laughs> all right, so, and the next thing Pierre suggested that we clarify uh, is the use of the word organic. So that's something that pops up uh, quite often in listings, and organic um, means not electronic, I guess would be a good way to say it. Um, organic instruments, real drums, a real guitar, um, a flute, um, a harp, uh, a real piano, um, as opposed to a synthesizer pad. Um, so that's what they mean when they say, you know, you might be wise to overdub some organic instruments. Uh, if you've got a track and it's largely, you know, if it's built using drum software and lots of synthesizers and a synth bass, but they don't want it to sound all that electro, well, overdub an acoustic guitar, overdub an electric guitar, overdub a real sounding piano. It could be a great sounding piano sample. Um, could be a harp. <laughs> um, so there you go. That's what organic means. Um, doesn't mean that it was grown in my backyard using no chemical laden fertilizer. Um, actually, that's what I could do about the squirrels and the crows. Next time I plant tomatoes and um, uh, zucchini, I'm going to give it that fertilizer that makes you glow in the dark. That way I can see the crows and squirrels at night. Um, all right, another uh, word or phrase he'd like um, clarified is a developmental arc. What is a developmental arc in the context of an instrumental cue? Um, it means that it feels like it's going somewhere and not just laying there like a lox. How do you accomplish that? by starting out, I've, I've said this a thousand times, by starting out kind of skinny and sparse on the instrumentation, and after four bars or eight bars, add a couple more instruments, take it out another eight bars, add a couple more instruments, fill it out a little bit, and then maybe that's the A section, then for the B section, drop it down to something sparse, or it could be a full-blown B section, but then when you come back to the A section, go back to the skinny version of it. Build it up, build it up, build it up, all as it's moving forward, and then give them a big finish at the end. So it actually feels like it's got some forward momentum. It's not just something that sounds like a loop. 
just staying like at the same dynamic level, the same volume level, the same intensity level, um, the same number of instruments. That's boring. Editors need different sections because they may really like the vibe and the emotion, um, the melody, the feel uh, of the cue and think, wow, that would work well in the scene. But if it's just a skinny version that doesn't go anywhere, it may not have enough oomph for what they need, but they will look at the waveform, uh, little waveform graph and go, oh, I can see it's got edit points in there. I can see that the back half where the waveform is a little bigger. So they'll just scooch right up uh, to one of those edit points and listen from there forward and go, okay, now that section's got a little more oomph. It's got the melody, the vibe, and the emotion I like. Therefore, I'm gonna use that section. So basically what you're doing, because it's extremely rare that they would use most of or an entire cue, they almost always just use sections of it. Um, so you've given them options, which is a great way to ensure a higher percentage of usages, a uh, higher number of usages of your material. So that's what a developmental arc is. Oh, he says, is it adding layers of instruments, getting rhythmically busier? No, it's not necessarily getting rhythmically busier. Getting rhythmically busier, um, frankly, probably knocks it down a couple notches for usability, I would think, um, because then you're getting into stuff that may distract from the dialogue or the voiceover or whatever. Um, I think it will very much help in the understanding of some listings, especially those ethnic-oriented ones, I guess. Uh, he just had a, an ampersand in there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, th those rules apply to the ethnic listings, whether it would be, you know, like Indian Bollywood music or Asian Koto music. Now, now that I mention the Koto, and did I mention that I've actually got a real one hanging on the wall in my office? I do. Um, so if you ever need to borrow one, come on down. Um, anyway, yeah, something like a Koto listing or Koto uh, cue probably wouldn't have, if it's a solo cue, it probably wouldn't have a lot of developmental arc. It could, just by what you play, could start out with, you know, dong, dong. Dong. And then maybe the next eight bars is dong, 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 dong. <laughs> so uh, that was my really, really, really best Kodo imitation right there. Um, which, by the way, I've seen videos of these really talented people playing Kotos that go through stomp boxes, you know, like loops and, and distortion boxes and, and reverb and stuff, just making some crazy music with those things. So there you go. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, Pierre also in another question um, asked, what does ear candy really mean? We, also, we see it often in the listing descriptions. Ear candy. Um, it doesn't mean a Snickers bar. Um, it doesn't mean candy that's shaped like an ear. Um, and speaking of Halloween, which is right around the corner, although kids are not allowed to go trick-or-treating this year, wow. Um, ear candy, uh, it's not little candy corns that you pluck out of your ears, <laughs> although that would be interesting. Um, ear candy, uh, if I had to define it, this is my own definition, other people might define it differently, but... It's my show, so it's my definition. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, narcissism on parade today. Uh, ear candy would be interesting little musical hooks. Um, they shouldn't steal the show, but they're salt and pepper. You know, sometimes they're MSG, but that's what they are. They're little flavors just thrown in there. It could be at the end of a musical phrase that you've got a cool little drum turnaround. Um, it could be a harp bliss. It could be, let's see, what else do I have? Um, eh, I don't really have it. It could be, 
<laughs> uh, not that. Because, uh, yeah, if you had that in there, that wouldn't be ear candy. That would come off sounding like crickets. Anyway, um, seriously, ear candy, uh, it would probably be an instrument that has not yet been introduced in any sor sort of major way. Maybe it's a synth part that was kind of pulled back and layered in, but maybe at the end of a musical phrase, it does a little ding, ding, ding. That's what I'm talking about. Just little dashes of flavor. Think of it as those multicolored sprinkles that go on top of a birthday cake when you're five, right? So that's all it is, ear candy. Um, it, it could be a, a little vocal lick, depending on the type of music. You know, that's the thing is I can't give you an exact description because the genre and the feel and the attitude, the emotion, all that stuff is kind of going to dictate what ear candy is. One thing I can tell you about ear candy is too much of it will make you sick to your stomach, just like real candy. So remember that when you're not trick-or-treating this year. Too much ear candy, not good. A tasteful amount of ear candy, very good. So I hope that clarifies that. Um, Peter Rahill had a suggestion, which I thought was really well thought out, and I really appreciate it, Peter. It's not something that I can really, or not some, something I want to do <laughs> for, ta for the quarantine happy hours. Um, and here, let me read you what he wrote, and then I'll tell you why. How about soliciting ideas for pre-designated show topics for each day? For example, Mondays could be, uh, or Mondays are usually special guest slash taxi business. Then follow up Tuesday, where you take questions, comments, and reviews of any overflow from Monday's show. Um, Wednesdays could be chat caller, where you call volunteers from the live chat watchers. Um, Thursday could be Member Music Thursday, like you've done before, listening and review of stuff that's sent in. Um, Friday could be Open Line Friday, Anything Goes, sort of like Ask Michael Anything. Those are just suggested titles, but you can choose from more popular ideas. Uh, just make it a consistent weekly, weekday theme or not. Well, I think that was really well thought out. Like I said, I really do appreciate it. But... When I first conceptualized doing the quarantine happy hours, um, I wanted it to be very little work for me because it was going to be on a daily basis. And the last thing I really need is to add an hour and a half. Because when you multiply um, one and a half hours, which is about what it takes me to do a quarantine every day, it really does take a little bit of preparation. Anything from just getting the tech set back up um, I mostly leave it set up, but I still have to test it every day, um, going through and looking for these comments to see if there's anything that I can use on the show, maybe looking at the forum to see if there are any um, issues popping up on the forum that I could address for you guys, um, or maybe it's going out picking tomatoes and, and squash so I can show it, you know, on the show, um, or readjusting the flowers. And by the way, nobody's mentioned today if you look at the cab, please take note of the fact that the door is open, the trunk is open, which means that our cabbie is sitting in front of the house waiting for his fare to show up so he can take him to the airport. And then they can sit in their seat on the airplane for three hours going, <sighs> breathing through their mask and not getting any food on the plane and not getting any liquor on the plane. Now that to me is funny. Um, Nothing more obnoxious than a drunk person on an airplane, right? When you, you're stuck in an aluminum tube going 500 miles an hour for, you know, oh gosh, I was on a flight to London, I think, one time. And somebody got on that flight that was rip-roaring drunk when they walked on. They never should have let them on. And then just proceeded to get more drunk. Why the flight attendants let the, Oh, he was sitting in first class, so he could drink all the free booze he wanted. This guy got so obnoxiously drunk that seriously, I thought the passengers were going to tackle him, tie him up with one of the seatbelts that the flight attendants use for the demonstration, open up the rear door and toss the guy. He was just so unbelievably obnoxious and dangerous to the flight crew, probably dangerous to passengers as well. Anyway, that was a bad experience. Um, 
so getting uh leaving the the airplane and the cab behind now going back to this topic is if i have like predetermined structured things that you know mondays are this and tuesdays are that and wednesdays are that then i've really got to put more preparation into it like i do for the monday show so that's why i try to keep this loosey-goosey but i really do like going in and looking at the comments from the previous day's show to see if you guys have given me stuff like you've given me here today because it gives me something to talk about and usually some pretty good stuff um Tony Salazzo said, Hi, sorry I missed the show, but I've enjoyed the replay, and, well, I didn't score that great. Oh, that was on, on the show on Monday where we did um, You Are in the A&R Hot Seat. Um, his follow-up Tuesday question, perhaps you could please pick the best or most suitable of the cues and go through by bar by bar. So that's like a bar crawl um, to say, listen to how they did this. And notice how at this point it does that to really deep dive into the composition. Not a bad suggestion. Um, because I'm not a composer, I'm not 100% sure. I would be the best person to do that. I, I could do a decent job. I'm not sure I would do the best job. And I wouldn't want to give you kind of a, a half-assed attempt. Sorry, uh, keep bumping the table. I wouldn't want to give you a half-assed attempt at it. But um, you know what? Let's try it. Um, one day next week, I'll try and uh, do that for at least a segment of one of the shows on Quarantini. Um, yeah, we can... Take one of the aforementioned, uh, one of the things that I played on the show Monday, on this past Monday's regular Taxi TV. Um, and I'll go through and say, oh, check that out. Check that out. I may not be able to use, um, you know, like talk about it being in the Aeolian mode or, but you know, I can use common terms like notice there's a lift here. Notice it breaks down for eight bars. Yeah, I can probably do it okay. Um, oh, here's a good one from Robert Orzachowski. It's a long one, but that's okay. I've got a half an hour, 28 minutes actually. Um, retro versus vintage. Good topic. I was wondering if we could talk about the different definitions on the taxi listings. There was one listing that was asking for pop songs with the retro feel. I'm going to underline that. Later in the body, it said they do not want vintage. I've always found this to be a difficult concept because you have to compose a contemporary song and somehow make it a throwback without it being actually a throwback. I think that they want a clean production with the basics of contemporary instruments mixed with vintage instruments like horns and keys. Um, it's, it still is confusing because when you compare Uptown Funk by Bruno Mars to Jungle Love by The Time, um, there is little difference that separates the two tracks other than the Uptown, Uptown being more crisp in production. Um, throw in a remastered version of Jungle Love and the differences shrink even more. I think if I'm not mistaken that vintage plus upgrade equals retro. Hard to say though because I'm not sure everyone reviewing the tracks will see it the same. Um... I'm not so sure that you've nailed the distinction. Um, I'm going to attempt, you know, like all things dealing with art, it's not um, an utter science. It's a mixture of art science, but here's what I say. Vintage, almost every vintage listing we run means that it's truly gotta be vintage. Um, that it was recorded back in the day. And as I've explained before, but I should repeat in the context of this discussion, is that when they want vintage music, usually the publishers are pitching that music as authentically vintage, like it was recorded in 1964 to the show whose music supervisor is looking for music for a scene that takes place in 1964. 
psychologically, it makes them feel really cool that they're adding authentic music that was done back then to a show that's supposed to be taking, or a scene anyways, excuse me, supposed to be taking place in 1964. Also, there is something textural about music that was recorded back then. It's not just about the crispness or the, you know, audio quality. There's just a thing that um, is so hard to explain, but when you hear it, you hear it. And, and as I've mentioned on other episodes, so I'm going to repeat it because not everybody watching today saw those episodes. Um, several years ago, we had one of my very favorite, favorite publishers in the industry join me for a thing on stage at the Road Rally. Um, and he is not even arguably, he's definitely the, the publisher that gets more um, vintage music placements, I would say, than any other publisher in the business as far as film and TV goes. And they always want authentic stuff. And so I played some music that I found that was made to sound vintage from Taxi Members. It was excellent. It was so good that I thought for sure it would fool him in... He knew in less than five seconds. I think he knew in about two seconds that he started shaking his head as soon as the music started playing. Go, nope, not vintage. He could hear and feel the difference. Even though that piece of music was as good as it gets, it was definitely an A-plus piece of music. And whoever created it at the time did an A-plus job of trying to make it feel like it was from another era. But this guy could tell. Um... There, there is a difference in the sounds. Even if you went to the extent of getting, let's say, a bass guitar that was manufactured in the early 60s and guitars and amps that were made in the early 60s and a drum kit that was from the early 60s um, and used microphones that were only available in the early 60s and used a console and outboard gear that was all that all dated back to that era he would still be able to tell the difference and here's why is people played differently then they did they attacked their instruments um differently they wrote melodies differently lyrics were different um mixing was different everything was just different so it's not just about the audio quality because yeah you know arguably i mean there's a studio in nashville i want to say it's called like 1975 recording i think um and i've seen i've looked at it on, on the internet go wow that, that's every bit of gear in that room is like the stuff that i started out on i could walk in that room and run everything in there and it would probably sound pretty much like the recordings that I used to do back in 1975, 76, 77, when I was just a young and in the business. But the players would be doing stuff differently because styles have changed. You don't wear shoes unless you wear hush puppies or, uh, you know, there are a few shoes that have um, stayed with us generationally. Um, you know, like, uh, what am I trying to think of? Converse All-Stars, right? They, you know what? That's actually, I'm glad I brought that up. Converse All-Stars, if you look at the All-Stars that are on the shelf at your local shoe store today, and if you were to hold them up next to a pair of vintage Converse All-Stars from the 70s, let's say, um, there are differences. The little label, the Converse label on the back of the shoe is a little different. Um, just the construction of them, a little different. The stitching, a little different. The colors, definitely different. Um, I'm a fanatic for, oh, I can't think they're also made by Converse. Um, can't think of the, hang on, I'm going to get a prop. I need to get something from the garage. Okay, 
today's show and tell are these awesome shoes. These are Converse Jack Purcells. Um, I love this particular shoe. I bought some like 15 years ago and people would stop me on the street and say, those are so awesome. I, where do I get those? I want some of those. I mean, if you look really closely, look at how, you know, the edges of the shoe are, you know, it's like kind of like getting a, a guitar out of the Fender Custom Shop where it's made to look vintage. So they do look vintage. Now, here's the thing is they made the, this was from the reason I bought these used <laughs> off of eBay was because after some period of years, they quit making them this style and they started making a new version of it, which to the casual observer looked the same. However, to the trained eye, the, the rubber, the gum rubber used on the side and the gum rubber used on the bottom, not the same. I can spot it from 10 feet away if somebody's got the real deal or the fake deal on. Um, the Jack Purcell label, not exactly the same. Um, the label on the inside, these are John Varvato's Converse X's, not the same. So little things like that. Um, I don't know what else is not the same, but they're not the same. So I bought a pair uh, only to find out that the old ones were made in the good old USA and the newer one was, were, were made in China, as our president loves to say. <laughs> Uh, and, and there was a difference. They were knockoffs. I mean, even the, the Chinese ones were, in fact, sold at a department store at Nordstrom's in a Converse box. So either Nordstrom's bought some Chinese knockoffs or maybe um, Converse started making them in China, which would not be surprising because so much stuff is made in China. Um, but they weren't the same. So this all goes back to music. Yes, you can knock it off. You can try and make it sound vintage, but there's a thing to the trained ear and to the psychological aspects of how music supervisors think um, vintage is important. Now let's talk about retro. Okay, so retro doesn't mean that you're taking something modern. Let me see if I can go back to... Um, Okay, pop songs with a retro feel. So, and later in the body it said they do not want vintage. So what they're looking for are, again, salt and pepper, seasonings, flavorings, little additions to a modern track that make it sound somewhat retro. What are those additions? It could be the sound of a guitar playing a style of lick. Let's say that you've got a cool, you know, modern track, but you've put on, uh, what's the Fender guitar um, that was so famous and all the Dick Dale surfer stuff um, in Beach Boys, that model of Fender. Maybe you got that guitar and just maybe the song isn't surf rock even, but maybe you threw in uh, a little lick that sounds a little surf rockish on that type of guitar. That makes it retro. It's got a throwback to a retro sound, but it's salt and pepper, right? Uh, Fender Jaguar, that was one. There was, wasn't there one other one? Um, Fender guitar used in surf rock. RareGuitars.com. Today, the Strat remains a favorite choice for surf guitar slingers. Wow. The most popular Fender surf machines, however, are the Jazzmaster and its twangy, shorter scaled cousin, the Jaguar. There you go, the Jazzmaster and the Jaguar. Um, okay, so, you know, that's how you make something sound retro, is having a, a regular old, you know, contemporary modern track that just has a little salt and pepper thrown in, like a nod to something from a different era. It could be vocal parts that sound like Motown backgrounds. 
It could be guitar licks that are reminiscent of Philly's soul. It could be uh, a modern country song. It could even be something like really cool modern, like, you know, a, kind of a hip hop thing that has um, a pedal steel in it to make a, a throwback or maybe has like a, a very 1971 string line, um, like, you know, a, a fiddle line in there, something. I, I'm, that one wasn't my best example ever, but you such knowledge in that little box. Yes. My dad, who's now 96 years old, once said to me, I've got a great idea for the internet. So he was sitting right here, actually, at this spot at this table, and I was showing him something on my computer and he, uh, how you could search for something on Google or whatever. And he said, or no, I wasn't showing Google, but he said, I've got a great idea. We should patent it. I said, what's that, Dad? He said, somebody should have a place, a website on the internet where you can go and ask any question and get an answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Dad. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was very cute that he suggested that. Um, ooh, Gibson SGs. You know, uh, Bria's husband has a Gibson SG hanging up in their uh, like extra bedroom at their house, which she uses as her office. And I look at that and it reminds, actually it's an Epiphone, but, which she pointed out to me yesterday. But when I was a kid, I took guitar lessons in my little hometown of Ottawa, Illinois, from a lady named Evelyn Brew, B-R-U-E. She just recently passed away. Uh, but you would walk up this really, really, really skinny and long flight of stairs, very poorly lit in this very old building, probably built in like the 20s or 30s. And it just smelled like old wood and dust. And you would get to the top of the stairs, hang a right and open the door to the Evelyn Brew School of Guitar. And that door would open and be like, ah, there was a wall. She only had two brands of guitars. And she had probably 30 of them hanging on the walls in the waiting room. And they were Fenders and Gibsons. Um, barely, rarely did she have any other brand hanging up there. And those obviously were the dominant brands are and probably still are. Um, and, and she always had these Gibson SGs and like this classic white. You know, it's kind of like the yellowish white on this shoe, but it, it wasn't made to look that way. It just was that way. See, it was vintage. It wasn't retro. <laughs> um, and she had that kind of burgundy-ish wood grainy SG. Oh, they were gorgeous. I've got to say, I've never been a fan of playing Gibson guitars because the necks are just a little too wide for my dainty little hands. Um, but just those guitars were just beautiful. Your 90-year-old dad is better at navigating YouTube than me. That's good. I'm glad you didn't say he's better at navigating something like uh, Pornhub or Chatterbait than you. <laughs> but then at 90, you could totally forgive that, right? <laughs> oh, my brother had a Mose right for two days. He went to camp. I tried to play it in the basement. The strap broke. It dropped off on the cement floor. I took a chunk out of the guitar. He came home. He wasn't happy. Frankly, Mark, I'm surprised that you got to live long enough to see what high school was like. Um... <laughs> Dan used to buy him woodworking videos for his birthday. Now he just looks it up on YouTube. Yeah, you can look up anything on YouTube. Um, ooh, Ian Shortle's got an SG standard. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so I hope that uh, clarifies the difference. Vintage is actually old. Vintage is a contemporary piece that just has hints of things that are throwbacks. It could be a stylistic hint. Um, it could be an uh, the choice of instrument you use to add. You know what? Here you go. Having something, having a modern track, but maybe with a Farfisa mini compact. I mean, it wasn't that... Uh, 
I'm trying to think, like I'm a Believer by the Monkees. Didn't that have a Farfisa organ in it? So there you go. You hear the Farfisa and it takes you back. It doesn't mean that you took the whole track and tried to make it sound like it was recorded in 1968 or whenever the Monkees were a thing. I think it was around 68. Um, it just means that you've got a little Farfisa lick, which would be ear candy. That would be retro ear candy. See how I did that? Huh? You liking it? All right. Next. Um, Tony Salazzo asked this, and I think he's correct in stating what he says. This might be better discussed in the forums, um, but I'm frustrated with mixing because what sounds good in one pair of headphones doesn't sound good in earbuds or speakers. Uh, I thought about buying a pair of Audio Technica ATH M20Xs, which are the headphones that the taxi screeners use. By the way, the screeners, we have those for them to use when they're in office. During COVID, they're not in the office and they're not using them. Um, but, you know, some of them use earbuds. Some of them bring their own headphones. Some of them, I've noticed, are using um, like the Bose noise canceling headphones just because it's what they know, what they're used to. Maybe it's what's comfortable on their big old ears. I don't know. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know that buying Audio Technica headphones to match what the taxi screeners would use under normal circumstances is such a great idea. I mean, they're cheap enough that, and they're good headphones that if you buy them, you won't be disappointed. A little tight on the ears though. After like half an hour, you, you do want to like take them off, go wabba wabba. Um, so I'm using what you guys are using, uh, meaning the AT MT M20 X's. Uh, we're getting some better monitor speakers or just getting that sonar works reference thing. But I don't like to throw money away on stuff if it won't make a real difference. I'm also frustrated that I can use. OK, so I'm going to call that one question. Tony, I don't know what you're using. Is Tony in the room today? Hey, Fett. Um, Fett's in the room. Azalea Music. I'll never part with my 71 pre-CBS telly. Woo. You may not part with it, but the next time I'm at your house, don't go take a piss. <laughs> if you come out and I'm not there, the guitar won't be there either. <laughs> oh, man. Um, it's tough. Finding headphones to mix on. There are some really expensive headphones that are more like 400 to maybe as much as a couple thousand bucks that were actually made to do mixes on. I've not personally used them, so I can't attest to the quality of the mixes you'll get by using them. I have seen good reviews, but you know what? When you're putting sound this close to your ears, especially in a closed situation, I mean, some of these might be more open air, but you know, when you've got the sound right up against your ears, it's not gonna be the same as mixing in the room and that's where i was going to go with this rather than i think the first thing you look at tony and this is just a guess on my part you may not have an optimal optimal mixing situation your monitors first of all check the phase that's always the best thing to do um take a stereo piano and sum it to mono. And if you hear a dramatic change in the sound of that piano, you may have a phase problem. And what you need to do is look, I don't know how advanced or not advanced you are on things like cable. I'm looking around, um, but you know what? If you look on speaker wire, you'll see that one side of the speaker wire probably has a little white line or maybe a little raised rib that runs alongside of it. And that will tell you that that's one side and that the other side that doesn't have it is the other side. So you need to be consistent. You need to make sure that um, your positive coming out of your amplifier, first of all, make sure that you've got the phase of the wires correct coming out of your mixer to your amplifier or if they're self-powered speakers, just make sure that plus goes to plus everywhere coming out of your mixer or coming out of your laptop. If you're going, you know, right out of your laptop into a pair of self-powered speakers uh, or monitors, as we like to call them in the business, make sure that 
you are matching positive to positive, negative to negative. Then, once you're absolutely certain that's correct, and believe me, I have found, I actually went to a major recording studio that we all know the name of back in the day in New York City, and I walked in and I threw up my Steely Dan quarter inch um, that was one generation away from a, a master, and put it on and instantly said to the assistant engineer who's working with me, something's wrong with the big monitors in here. And he goes, what? And I said, I don't know. And I hit the mono button on the console and I said, they're out of phase. Sure enough, they had an amp blow. They replaced the amp probably in the middle of the night with some stoner techie and he didn't check the phase. So check the phase. Once you're sure your phase is absolutely correct, then hit the mono button on a stereo piano or a stereo guitar. And if you hear some frequency seriously drop out, that's a problem. Um, so you may have phase issues elsewhere. Assuming that you don't hear that problem, then you've got to consider, I'm looking around for props, but I, I took my speakers back up to the loft. Um, you may have your monitors set below ear level. You may have them set higher than ear level. You may have them sitting on a desk, which is up against a flat wall in the room that you're using. And you're getting all this low end buildup that's coming off the back of those monitors and down around your ankles, between your ankles and your knees, there's all this bass buildup. So you're getting a false impression of where the bottom end is with your monitors. Therefore, you're going to have less bottom in your mix and it's gonna sound thin when you check it on other systems. It could be that you're working in a room that's got, you know, fairly standard sheetrock walls, which are fairly reflective. Um, and you're in a typical 10 by 12 bedroom and you've got the monitors on a desk without any foam or anything to isolate them from the desk, which the desk then becomes, uh, you know, gets sympathetic vibrations and becomes a resonator of its own self giving you yet another sense of false impression of how much bottom you've got or don't. Uh, and so let's say you're in a 10 by 12 bedroom and you've got stuff reflecting off the back wall, off the floor, off the ceiling. You don't need an acoustically perfect space, but what you need are to follow some basic rules of, uh, not acoustically perfect, but acoustically sensible right? Um, you don't need to build a room within a room. Um, you probably don't need to build like a trapezoidal, you know, room within a room. And that's impractical for most people, but there are some things you can do, like, you know, do the measurements, get the right um, triangle going for the distance between your monitors and the focal point of where they're hitting. Make sure that they're at eye level, you know, ear level. Um, make sure that your hair is combed properly so it absorbs just the right amount of top end. This would be really good for mid-range. Um, uh, you could hang, um, you know what? You could hang curtains on the wall that your monitors are blowing at. You could buy, um, I like the, the, not resonators, the, not deflectors, um, what do they call it? Uh, hey, Fett, jump in here with me. What do they call it uh, when you throw sound against something and it dis disperses it? Um, get some of those panels that look like a New York City skyline um, and uh, throw those up on the wall so that it breaks up the sound and, and causes the reflections to be random. That will help. A diffuser, thank you. Um, you could build Heimholtz resonators, but that's a little heavy for a home studio. Sonics, I personally have tried it a couple of times, did not have great success um, with Sonics. Uh, but you know what? You can go get um, pressed fiberglass bats, you know, not like baseball bat, but batting. It's like two or three inches thick and it's probably, you know, um, 16 inches wide because that's the space between two by fours and a typical wall. Um, and then cover those bats um, so they're like pressed fiberglass and then get some of the soft pink fiberglass that comes on a roll and kind of take a really sharp big knife that looks like you're gonna go kill somebody um, and, and 
cut down the middle of that rolled fiberglass and then glue it or staple it even better staple it to the batting and then cover it with um, some sort of acoustically transparent fabric how do you know what which fabrics are acoustically transparent when you go to the fabric store to buy it hold it up to a light if you can see light through it that means sound waves can also pass through it the more light that comes through it the more acoustically transparent it is burlap is something a lot of people use on those baths personally i think it smells after a while it tends to absorb every odor in the room but you can buy um nylon double knit um just yeah go to any of the fabric stores like i can't think of like joann's i think is a fabric store that's in almost every ball in america and just walk in and say um i need some um double knit fabric and then when they show you the double knit hold it up and if you can see a decent amount of light through it that means it's acoustically transparent i see people chatting about ns10s in there yeah if you want to see like really good acoustically transparent double knit take the grills off of a pair of ns10s and hold it up and there you go wow it's 501 holy crap um yeah you don't have to necessarily buy acoustic fabric you can just buy regular double knit as long as you can see light through it the more light you can see the more acoustically transparent it is um so that's what i would do i i would read fett's book i would go online and learn anything you can about setting up a basic home studio but it, it really comes down to are your monitors isolated are they not right up against a wall um you know if you've uh got a false sense of bottom end you may want to do something like uh, believe it or not this actually will work if you take a box like the size of what a suitcase would come packaged in a large suitcase take that box and fill it with fiberglass or or any sort of fluffy like pillow stuffing and put that down where your feet are underneath the desk that will actually soak up some bottom end um all right, so we will talk about this other stuff. I'm making a note and we can talk about the other stuff. Um, remember, False Sense of Bottom Man, is that a country song? It very well might be. I had a too, too much to drink last night and had a false sense of bottom end. Um, there you go. An open closet um, is a nice acoustic dampener. Just make sure you come out of the closet when you're done checking it out. <laughs> Woo! Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where is it? Bada boom, bada bing. Anyway, uh, thanks for hanging out with me today. Remember, no quarantini tomorrow because I am working yet again on road rally stuff. And I will be back Monday with um, Ed Hartman, our percussionist expert who has turned his love of all things percussive into a pretty nice career doing music for film and television and also he kind of specializes in doing music for short films which is cool uh, and then on tuesday when we reconvene here for more quarantini happy hour i will continue with these excellent questions posed by you guys in the comment section which i'd really appreciate it if you would go in there and post some comments after this show is up uh, on youtube um don't forget to give us a thumbs up and like us don't forget to subscribe if you're not a subscriber and with that i will bid you all a fond farewell until monday at 4 p.m los angeles time or pacific time uh right here same channel and we will do a taxi tv and i will see you on tuesday where's the band there's the band bye you guys over and out see ya